Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Targeted killings of minority community continue in Jammu and Kashmir. Afghanistan humanitarian crisis continues. And Pakistan on the verge of collapse as IMF reluctant to provide bailout. Let's begin the show with India's Jammu and Kashmir, where Pak back terrorists shot dead a man belonging to Kashmiri Hindu community in Pulwama district in another targeted killing in the valley. Terrorists killed a 40-year-old Kashmiri Hindu identified as Sanjay Sharma working as an armed guard at a bank in his village in the Achan area in South Kashmir district. He was immediately rushed to a hospital, but he succumbed to his injuries. A report. On February 26th, yet another member of the Kashmiri Pandit community was targeted in Jammu and Kashmir. Park back terrorist shot dead a 40-year-old Kashmiri Hindu Sanjay Sharma in Pulwama. He worked as an armed guard at a bank in his village in the Achhan area. Sharma was shot while he was going to the market, after which he was shifted to a hospital, but he succumbed to the injuries. कश्मीरियत बदनाम हो रही है हमारा इस्लाम बदनाम हो रहा है इस्लाम में कहीं पर यह दारिज नहीं है कि आप खून ना हक बहाओ राजा हम रो रो के बोल रहे हैं जिसने भी यह किया बहुत खून ना हक किया बहुत बड़ा गुनाह किया अल्लाह उसको भी नहीं छोड़ेगा just two days after the incident security forces neutralized the terrorists who carried out the attack police identified one of the slain ultras as aqib mushtaq bhat who was active in the Pulwama region. Mushtaq was initially working for Hezbul Mujahideen terror outfit and was currently working for the resistant front, an offshoot of lashkar e -Taiba. The second terrorist has been identified as Ajaz Ahmad Bhatt and hails from Malangpura in Pulwama. एच uh, के साथ मुंसलिक था और उसके बाद ये जो है यहां पिछले कुछ महीनों से टीआरएफ लश्कर के साथ जो है काम कर रहा था दूसरे जो टेररिस्ट है उसकी भी شناخت तब हो गई है उसका नाम इजाज अहमद भट्ट है वो पस्तून अतराल का रहने वाला है और ये दोनों जो है जो इजाज है ये जैश के साथ मुंसलिक था और इसने भी जॉइंटली एच और लश्कर के साथ जो है ये एक यूनिक चीज जो सामने आ रही है कि जॉइंटली काम करना शुरू किया था और ये दोनों टेररिस्ट जो हैं वो जो रीसेंट माइनॉरिटी कम्युनिटी की जो किलिंग हुई है उसमें इन्वॉल्व थे नोटेबली दिस इज नॉट द फर्स्ट टाइम दैट कश्मीरी हिंदूज हैव बीन टारगेटेड इन द रीजन इन डिसम्बर एलिटीज टी आर एफ थ्रेटेंड कश्मीरी पंडित गवर्नमेंट एम्प्लॉज रिजाइडिंग इन द एरिया In the letter addressed to Kashmiri Pandit employees, the terror group warned that they would turn transit colonies of Kashmiri Pandits into graveyards. There has been a wave of targeted killings in Kashmir since the beginning of the last year. According to Jammu and Kashmir police report, there have been 14 targeted killings in the region in 2022 in Jammu and Kashmir in which six were Kashmiri Hindus. The victims have been local policemen, Hindu government employees, as well as non-locals working in the valley. Terror outfits in Pakistan have modified their approach to attacks and targeted killings. They are currently focusing on Kashmiri Hindus and security personnel. They want to reinstate fear in the minds of common Kashmiri people that to get killed, one need not to be an influential person being from the minority community is sufficient enough however such barbaric terror acts will not succeed in undermining jammu and kashmir's development journey as people in kashmir will not let this conspiracy succeed deadly attacks abject poverty unprecedented inflation and shrinking forex reserves the list of problems in pakistan rages on and on The International Monetary Fund's reluctance in providing Pakistan bailout relief has further twisted the knife in its wounds. 
Is the end near for Pakistan? Or will Pakistan be able to miraculously emerge from the crisis? Let's try to find all answers to these questions. Rarely has the IMF appeared as hesitant as it is in the case of Pakistan, where even months of negotiations have yet to persuade the global lender to release over a billion dollars to the struggling nation. Pakistan has been desperately trying to obtain the 1.1 billion final tranche of the 6.5 billion USD bailout program finalized with the IMF in 2019. The IMF has time and time again refused to release the funds, for Pakistan has no sustainable economic structure in place to pay back the loans. After advice from the IMF, including from its chief, Kristalina Georgieva, asking the Pakistan government to heavily tax the country's rich. Pakistan presented the finance bill last week to shore up its revenues by around 650 million USD, approximately 170 billion Pakistani rupees. The IMF has warned the country that it must take tough measures over a sustained period in order to prevent itself from plunging into a point of no return. Many say that Pakistan is unlikely to collect as much revenue as is the current goal. Even if the country succeeds in raising 650 million USD, is there any plan of action that can put Pakistan on a correction course? With its citizens fighting for daily survival, Pakistan is deeply indebted. The country's total external debt amounted to 126.3 billion USD at the end of 2022. This is even more worrisome when the inflation rate in Pakistan is already hovering at around 30%. As per a World Bank estimation, the debt service on all external debt in 2023 will be 26.4 billion USD. What do you have left now? There's absolutely nothing. So even the money that is going to come, it is previously sanctioned money, if it comes at all. It is previously sanctioned money and it is only going to last you till about uh, April or May. As if the country's economic uncertainty wasn't enough, the Pakistani political landscape is becoming increasingly unstable by the day. Shabazz Sharif's government and the former Prime Minister Imran Khan have been mudslinging each other. Both sides have traded blows and have accused each other of incompetence. Khan, despite being ousted as Prime Minister, enjoys huge popular support and has by and large succeeded in disrupting the daily functioning of the government. On the other side, Sharif and his coterie have increased pressure on Khan and have charged him with several strict violations. This has led to a widening of the rift between the two side supporters. Some experts have cautioned that a deteriorating political landscape, coupled with widespread poverty, could trigger a civil war in the state. Pakistan, remember, is a highly militarized society. It is an extremely violent society. I mean, you see even at the best of times how violent they are. You have mobs that go around burning people for blasphemy. You have uh, terrorist attacks all over the place. The crumbling political and economic foundations of Pakistan have paved the way for terrorism in the country to rear its ugly head. The series of events has particularly emboldened the TTP, the Tehriki Taliban Pakistan. Rival factions in Islamabad have blamed each other for the TTP's resurgence. The TTP has not only wreaked havoc across Pakistan, targeting both civilians and security forces alike but has also staked a claim on forming government. As per various news reports, the TTP has already announced a parallel, full-fledged cabinet. The TTP poses an imminent threat as Pakistan, already severely economically weakened, is in no position to wage war against terrorism in the country. With multiple crises plaguing Pakistan's common people, one can only hope that relief will come from any front possible. Moving on, 
India expressed its concern over the rise of terrorism at the United Nations and stated that nations that harbour terrorists should be denounced and held responsible for their actions. The comments were made on March 1st during Ruchira Kambots, India's permanent representative to the UN, remarks at the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism ambassadorial level quarterly briefing to member states. A report. India continues its strong and focused commitment to help UN member states to build capacity and counter terrorism. Along with huge monetary contributions in the fight against terrorism, New Delhi is always very vocal about this global threat. At the United Nations, India voiced concern over the spread of terrorism and asserted that those countries which provide shelter to terrorists should be called out and held accountable for their deeds. The remarks came when India's permanent representative to the UN, Ruchira Kambod, was speaking at the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism Ambassadorial Level Quarterly Briefing to Member States on March 1st. Kambod emphasized that the threat of terrorism can only be through consistent and unified multilateral action by the international community. The threat of terrorism is serious and real. Regrettably, despite best efforts aimed towards transnational cooperation, it continues to spread, particularly in the regions of Africa and Asia. These are worrying trends and need urgent reversal. The threat of terrorism can only be tackled through consistent and unified multilateral action by the international community. Those states which lack capacities to tackle the threat of terrorism should be assisted, while those which provide shelter to terrorists should be called out and held accountable for their deeds. India stressed the need for the international community to focus its efforts on solving more pressing challenges, such as the growing threat of financing terrorism, which has been made worse by terrorists and terrorist groups' use of cutting-edge technologies. India has hosted the third No Money for Terror conference in November 2022 and has offered to host the permanent secretariat for the conference in Delhi as one of the concrete outcomes of that event. In October 2022, India hosted the special meeting of Counterterrorism Committee, which had adopted the Delhi Declaration on countering the use of new and emerging technologies. Also, New Delhi has given the UN Office of Counterterrorism more than 2 million US dollars in recent years to support its global initiatives to stop the financing of terrorism and stop terrorists from traveling. We should exert our energy on addressing more serious issues, such as the growing threat of terror financing, which has been further exacerbated by the use of new and emerging technologies by terrorists and terrorist groups. New Delhi has been engaging with everybody around the world in order to curb the menace of terrorism. It has urged everybody to be on the same page when it comes to combating a common enemy. Recently, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Italy's PM Giorgia Meloni held wide-ranging talks in New Delhi during her visit to India. In their talks, India resolved to fight against terrorism and separatism in all their forms and manifestations as PM Modi strongly pitched for strengthening international partnership and concerted action in addressing the menace of terrorism. Atankwaad aur algaavwaad ke khilaaf ladai mein Bharat aur Italy kandhe se kandha milakar chal rahe hain. However, it has also been seeking reforms when it comes to working methods of subsidiary bodies of the Security Council. It said that the archaic and opaque methods must now be open, transparent and credible. India wants these regimes to remain under constant review so that they keep pace with the changing situation on the ground. An extra push comes in the backdrop of Pakistan's intensified multi-layered efforts at infiltrating terrorists into Indian territory, denting harmony by stalking fanatic passions 
and flaring separatist agenda by working overtime to indoctrinate youths of Kashmir. Although they have been responded with an iron fist, Indian aim is to bring a perennial state of peace in the country and around the world. And for that, all it has been demanding is an integrated response to terrorism, no matter where it is emanating from. As Afghanistan walks through the second day of the Taliban rule and the world powers and global media move onto the other sides, what is the future of the political state, the Emirate in Afghanistan? The Taliban maintain that they have learned from their mistakes of their earlier tenure in the 1990s. But are they able to create any state of apparatus of governance? Take a look. Afghanistan remains the world's largest humanitarian crisis in 2023. Economic downturn continues to fuel the crisis in Afghanistan and there have been no encouraging developments towards getting girls back into classrooms. Long gone are the days when the US administration embraced women's rights and empowerment of women as a justification for its war on the Taliban. Long gone are the days when it was announced that the preconditions for U.S. negotiations with the Taliban included the Taliban's renunciation of Al-Qaeda and their commitment to uphold the Afghan constitution and protect women's rights. More than a year after the EU has spent a mere 400 million on humanitarian aid for Afghanistan, despite the US spending 300 million a day for 20 years during the war, we've got to a place where now women are even banned from public parks. What an absolute unmitigated disaster. Ignoring Afghanistan is not a solution. And yes, we should open our borders and take on refugees. Daily, I met with desperate pleas of people. But how many are we going to take? One million? Two? Then what are we going to do with the millions who are left behind? I'm assuming that nobody here is mad enough to think of invading again. If that's the case, we have to deal with reality. The most basic human right is the right to life. We have to start allowing the economy to function, linking improvements to that. Anything else is condemning Afghan women, not just to exclusion, but to death. We have to stop standing idly by. Violence in Afghanistan dipped after the Taliban seized power in August 2021. But in the past year, security has worsened with a spate of mass casualty attacks claimed by ISIS regional chapter. The Islamic State Khurasan militants have intensified their attack, targeting foreign embassies, diplomatic missions, hotels and educational institutions over the past months which resulted in the death and injury of scores of innocent people. Taliban forces killed a top ISIS commander, Kari Fateh, who allegedly planned attacks against diplomatic missions in Afghanistan's capital. According to Taliban officials, Fateh directly masterminded recent operations in Kabul, including against diplomatic missions, mosques and other targets. Amidst the increasing attacks, Islamic Emirate, however, claims to ensure security in the region. Soik Alhamdulillah, the Kabinashat, the Commission of Khaspe, Alhamdulillah, the Inshrayas, the Imorot, the Hors Akhrin, Payomeke, Commission of Dostan, Organoi Amnitim, Alhamdulillah, Dostan, Shumahudat on Didinke. The humanitarian and economic crisis, which has already caused immeasurable harm to millions, has not abated and is predicted to worsen partly due to the interruption of international development assistance and the freezing of Afghan assets abroad. The abolition of independent oversight mechanisms and the institutions that protect human rights, especially the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, leaving Afghans with no avenue for redress. The administration of justice has been compromised, with the applicable law unclear and judges and other judicial officials replaced, especially affecting women. Press freedom has been suppressed with access to information curtailed. 
journalists, human rights defenders and civil rights activists have either left the country or quit their activities altogether and gone into hiding. Many educators, academics and artists have been forced to do the same. In the absence of an inclusive and representative government, the prospects for long-lasting peace, reconciliation and stability will remain minimal. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa.nin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.